everyone. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me to talk about feeding bees. Um, please let me know if uh, the sound is okay. If you want me to talk a little bit louder, put the computer a little bit closer to my face. Uh, that would be great. <laughs> That's funny. Wildwoods honeybee farms put first. All right. Thanks everyone for joining me. Um, I'd love to see where you guys are from. So if you are interested, uh, I'd love to see in the comments where you're tuning in from, you know, get as specific as you like. No need to give me the exact location, but it's nice to see um, where everyone is logging in from. And today I am talking, uh, thanks Marissa. Uh, I'm talking about feeding your bees. It is something, I will be honest with you, I actually had to do a little bit of research. <laughs> before I talked about it because there is um oh ooh, and someone from Kauai you guys you lucky dogs with your no varroa mites um I am so envious uh feeding bees is like can be simple but also can get kind of complicated and it like a lot of things in beekeeping varies depending on the time of year what's going on with your bees um where you're located oh so kentucky texas Kauai, north carolina houston texas alabama california oh philadelphia pennsylvania thank you gregory <laughs> connecticut maryland florida colorado Fiji. Oh, nice. Um, all right. So I will say that one reason why I had to look up feeding bees and do more research about it was because I used to work for a commercial apiary and they were certified by an outside source uh, as organic. And so part of that organic certification was they were not allowed to ever feed their bees. So I didn't learn from them how to feed bees, and I only knew what I had learned while in Pennsylvania as a hobby beekeeper about feeding bees. So there is, you know, the syrup, which is the primary feed, and then there's also pollen. You can feed bees. When making syrup, you want to take usually like a dry white sugar. You don't want to take a brown sugar or uh, powdered sugar. You want to take something that just doesn't have anything that could potentially harm the bees. And you mix it with water uh, into there's different ratios you can do depending on the time of year and what you're looking to do. I did learn a couple of interesting things when making syrup. Uh, one thing is that when you're making syrup, bees technically they can't they can't turn syrup into honey. So although you can technically see um, them gathering syrup and putting it into cells in your comb, they're never going to turn that into honey. Syrup can never be turned into honey. Only nectar from flowers can be turned into honey. But when you are feeding bees with the intention of stimulating them, uh, you are trying to emulate nectar. And so then you actually want there to be a fairly high water content. So you want to do like a one-to-one um, -one, uh, water to sugar, or you want to do like a two-to-one water, two parts water, one part sugar. Uh, if you do too thick of a mixture and have too much sugar added in, that is helpful for the bees in say late fall when you're looking to just add some bulk to the hive so that they just have food. But um, if you're looking in the springtime and the summer to maybe encourage uh, the bees to build comb or to get that queen to keep laying because um, you know a big nectar season is coming up soon or you just did a split and you want that split to grow really fast, then you're actually wanting to emulate 
syrup, uh, you want to make a syrup that actually doesn't have as much sugar in it because you want it to be more like nectar. And you want to kind of trick the bees into thinking there is a bloom uh, going on uh, and to get the queen to lay and for the bees to start building comb. Uh, which is an interesting thing I actually was not aware of. Now, when we feed bees, you don't you don't have to feed bees. Uh, well, technically, uh, there's not like it's not like when you get a cat or a dog where that's like one of the main things your job is is to to feed them. But it is good to feed bee syrup and some benefits and reasons why you'll feed bee syrup is because your bees are starving. And so although it's not good for them, for them to eat the syrup, it's better than starving. Um, you would give bees syrup in the fall so that they are not eating the honey they have stored up for winter. Uh, you would give bees syrup to help a small hive grow um, instead of them wasting that nectar that they're gathering um, on uh, using it to secrete beeswax and to build that honeycomb right off the bat you can make it easier for them and give them syrup and they can build honeycomb and give the queen lots of places to lay and um, help that small hive grow a lot faster. Or if it's a hive that you just split, then you would help that split grow a lot faster. So your uh, the syrup can really be a growth stimulant for the bees. Uh, some studies have shown that it can also stimulate hygienic behavior among bees. And so when you have this syrup, you also add uh, uh, pro health or honeybee healthy, or you can make your own um, Concoction is uh, essential oils. Usually there's some lemongrass added in, maybe um, peppermint and these other essential oils that help the bees digest the syrup so that they don't get nosema, which is the spores in their digestive system. And so um, making syrup is also a way to feed bees this stuff, which can help encourage hygienic behavior. And hygienic behavior means that they are hygienic, um, not only in, you know, getting rid of chalk brood, which is like this like moldy pupa in the hive and stuff like that, but also getting rid of varroa mites and cleaning themselves off and removing varroa mites from the hive. So uh, there's, there's a lot of benefits to syrup, um, but there also can be downsides to syrup. So now knowing the benefits to syrup, the big question most people have isn't really like, should I feed my bee syrup? But like, when do you stop? Um, Scott Benjamin says, I use Hive Alive. Is that like a pro health, uh, like a essential oils, I'm assuming. Uh, and just so you know, if you when you make your syrup, you could just keep it in the fridge. I had a pro health bottle for like, it was like, I think seven years sitting in my refrigerator. Um, and once you make the syrup and add it to the syrup, you can keep it in a jar in your refrigerator for quite a long while too. Um, when you stop feeding the bees is, you know, when they don't need it anymore, definitely if you're going to put your honey super on, so you have two boxes for brood. And when you're going to add that honey super on, you definitely don't want syrup being fed to your bees. Although they can't turn it into honey, they're still gonna put it in cells along with their honey and nectar that they're, the nectar that they're gathering. And so it's going to make your honey taste really gross. Um, but what I found is that usually the first box of your beehive, or if you're using like a top bar or long line shelf hive, that first, that intersection is brewed. And then that second box of your beehive is often like half honey and half, um, half brood. And so even at that point, when you're sticking that second box on your hive and you're going to have over eight frames of brood on a beehive, syrup should not really be necessary. Um, but uh, for the sake of like, you know, making sure that your hive is, is large enough. So if you're feeding your bees for the sake of expanding the hive and helping them grow when you first get them, once that first box is full, you can take the syrup away. 
Um, if you have a feeder in the hive and they're not using it, they're not accessing it, then that's another time that you should be taking it away as well. Um, if there is adequate food around uh, for the bees to gather, then that is the time that you can probably take your feed away. But then uh, say you live in an area where your hive grows and there's a big bloom in uh, late spring. And then it's kind of a dearth, which we call like a low nectar season. There's not many flowers blooming. And then another nectar season comes, like say in the late summer. And you are aware of this. This is something that other beekeepers have told you about or you experience. Then during that in-between phase, when there's not a lot of nectar coming in, you're, would, it, your hives would benefit. You don't have to, but your hives would benefit from feeding them syrup during this low nectar season in the middle to keep your hive population high so that when that nectar season comes back in a couple of weeks, your hive population is still strong and your hive has adequate bees to go out and forage for um, the nectar that is now available. If you let the bees do their thing, which is totally fine. By the time the queen's laying starts to go back up again, it might be too late for the bees to gather enough food. Um, now, when it comes to feeding, there are some things that beekeepers do that some of it just comes from more of the commercial end of things. Um, for one, if you are going to feed your bees in the middle of summertime or early summer when it's warm out, you should know that the syrup is going to go bad. And it can go bad pretty fast when it's warm out. So like one thing that commercial apiaries will do is they will add a little bit of bleach to their feed. Let me see if I can find what this um, ratio is for the bleach. Now, if you're adding like a Pro Health, Honey Bee Healthy, you don't need to add the bleach. That should um, encourage the, make the sear blast a whole lot longer. But if you are not going to be adding that stuff in, um, then you can add a little bit of bleach to it. Let's see. I want to see it somewhere in my notes. One teaspoon per gallon to keep syrup growing bad in the heat. Or you can add the Honey Bee Healthy or Pro Health. So um, now that's what commercial apiaries do because they have hundreds, well, most likely like thousands of hives. And so they want to put a whole bunch of syrup in a hive and they don't want to have to go back out there, you know, <laughs> like a week later, they want that to be it for a while. So they don't even really have the ability to go and visit all of these hives so often. So they will add bleach to it. But for a hobby beekeeper, it's much better for the bees to add the pro health to it than for them than to add the bleach to it because it can spoil. So um, usually like what I've always told my students is to do a one-to-one -one ratio of sugar to water for springtime feeding, like when you first get your bees and they're a package or a nuke to help uh, just help them out in, in case they might be starving, especially the package. This package is the most important because they come with nothing except for a can of syrup. And if you shake that can and it's feeling a little light, then they might have absolutely no food and they will be starving and you really should, should feed them. Um, so it's usually, um, one-to-one -one ratio of water to sugar or like, you know, it'll be like about 10 pounds of sugar, like a town pound bag of sugar to five quarts of water. Uh, and that would make a one-to-one -one ratio. And you just heat up the water uh, on a stove until it's at boiling point, take it off the heat and then slowly add in the sugar and stir it up until the water is dissolved. You can put it back on the heat if you're having trouble getting the water to dissolve. But, um, you want to just, once it's fully dissolved, you want to let it sit and cool down before you add the Pro Health or any of those essential oils. Um, let's see. I fed a couple weeks ago using syrup with Honey Bee Healthy and Mega Bee. Oh, what is, um, oh, I should read the next comment. Mega Bee really changes the consistency and color of the syrup. 
says it has a high protein content. Um, so that's a good point because the next thing that you will want to feed your bees is pollen and pollen is for the protein. If you just feed them syrup, then that can cause this protein deficiency within your hive. So it's important to offer your bees both. And before I get into pollen, I just want to talk to the beekeepers in the warm areas like myself, because you don't have to feed your bees syrup the way that beekeepers that are getting their bees in the springtime do because there is a good chance that when their bees come in the spring that their bees came from a place in the south when i got my bees in philly the bees came from georgia or tennessee and they were that the climate is you know much warmer and they prepare the hives there and bring them up to the colder climates and so you're now bringing them to this colder climate that may or may not have food for them. It could be rainy up there. It, you know, um, other people's bees might still be clustered up inside the hive. Um, when I picked my bees up my second year as a beekeeper, I went to this place like outside of Harrisburg and there was snow on the ground when we were driving to the farm to get the bees. And I could not put them in the hive right away when I got to Philadelphia. It was raining out there and cold and I felt awful like uh, putting them in that hive with that little can of syrup because I just, it, it was it was a rough <laughs> way to introduce them to Pennsylvania, um, to the Philadelphia area. So for them, you really want to give them syrup. I actually put in a request to a farm up north uh, in Javi, I was going to buy a couple packages, some nukes actually, and film that for the YouTube channel, you know, picking up bees, transporting them, getting a brand new hive and all that. And I didn't hear from him since January. And then I just heard from him yesterday, actually, for the first time saying the nukes were ready for pickup. Can I come at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning to come get them? <laughs> uh, so here in this climate, it's a lot harder to find bees. And when they do come, it can be very last minute. And you don't have to, if I was gonna pick them up, I wouldn't have to put a feeder in there unless I really wanted them to grow um, as fast as, as I could get them. Uh, there is adequate food around for them. And actually someone mailed me a feeder for free. He makes them and sells them on Etsy and he sent me one and I put syrup in it numerous times and I never saw a single bee at the feeder. It was always just ants and geckos. Um, I did a few different ratios that he recommended of sugar to water and bees just didn't care. And I think that's because there's enough food for them that they don't need it. Um, but it is always good to just give them a little bit of syrup as an option so that when your bees are new, whether it's a warm climate or not, they can build honeycomb a little bit faster. Now, you don't want to feed them like a ton. You don't want to put this huge feeder with like a gallon of syrup in this tiny little hive. Um, you just want to be able to see that there is like little bits of white wax, like you'll see new honeycomb. And the way you know that the honeycomb is new is that the, the comb is like white. Uh, it's very likely that the cells will actually look like cylinders. They won't be hexagon shaped yet, which is really cool to see. And um, or you might see like little bits of white wax under the lid and between frames and stuff where like you, you signs that bees are secreting bees that have secreted beeswax recently. Um, honey bee healthy is really just essential oils. I feel like I could just add those oils. You could. Um, it's just, you know, <laughs> essential oils are expensive. And if you're not getting real essential oils, they're less expensive. It can just be a little tricky to find essential oils in um, that are true essential oils and not just scents. And so I just found that the Honey Bee Healthy is uh, 
a little bit cheaper and comparable in price to buying the real essential oils and adding them in. And also there's just less room for error when using the, I, I use Pro Health. I don't know if there's other things in Pro Health than Honey Bee Healthy. That's just what I happened to buy it from Dayant years ago. Um, but it's just easier because it just has the instructions on how much to add to it on the back. And I don't really think you're saving much money um, the other way, but you can add your own essential oils if you like. I just don't know how much to tell you to add to your syrup um, uh, if you if you do it yourself. Um, let's see, next comment. In Maryland, the bees have been bringing in pollen for about two weeks. We'll add one-to-one -one syrup starting this weekend with Honey Bee Healthy as added nutrition. And yeah, if you already have your bees, um, uh, it's really important to just hang out next to the hives and see them and see if they're bringing pollen in on their legs. I only fed my bees pollen um, in Pennsylvania. I've never fed my bees pollen here in Hawaii. And I will say, I worked for a place that had fed the bees pollen when we were doing queen breeding. And it caused us really severe small hive beetle infestation. The pollen patties, we just put a little bit on there, but they got slimed by the small hive beetles really, really fast. So if you live in a warm climate, I really don't recommend pollen patties unless it is like total dearth, there's no flowers blooming, like incredibly dry or a rainy season where like the blooms have fallen off the flowers um, and just give them a small amount and really keep an eye on it because the hive beetles, I mean, the hive beetles aren't necessarily looking for honey. Like I, I see them in rotting fruit. They're looking for pollen. They will really take over that pollen patty. And I don't think that's an area that the bees are really like guarding uh, so if they're not paying attention to it, then it can get slimy really fast. Um... Uh, Ryan says, I saw elsewhere to feed the bees fondant uh, looked like cake icing. Uh, that is a, so that's the wintertime feed and that you do not want to feed your bees sugar in the wintertime when it is cold enough that the bees are clustered up. Um, some people say that the moisture that evaporates from that isn't good for the bees. That might be true, but there's already a ton of moisture inside the hive, so I don't know how bad that is. I have read that it's not good for the bees. Like, when they are eating that syrup, they are then going to have to do a cleansing flight. And on top of that, if you if you give the bees like a one to one syrup, um, if it's fifty percent sugar or less sugar, and then you are giving them the impression that there is nectar coming in and you can encourage the bees to actually want to leave the hive. And that is very bad if it is winter time and a time when they should be clustered up. So you don't want to confuse the bees and cause more harm than good. You want to put either dry white sugar or you want to make that sugar candy uh, and put that under the inner cover for the bees as a backup feed. Yeah, I have made syrup and kept it in my fridge for like a year. <laughs> I don't remember how good it was after a year, but it definitely will last you at least three months, I would say. But it is better to give the bees syrup when it comes to the springtime. Springtime, you're not looking to, so actually even, um, there is feeding your bees for the sake of them not starving. And then there's feeding your bees for the sake of stimulating growth and encouraging the bees to build honeycomb. Uh, and so winter time, you are looking to give them dry white sugar or fondant for the intention of them not starving. And then in the springtime, 
or when you make a split and have a small hive, there are two potential things you might want to be doing. You might want to prevent them from starving, of course. And in that case, ideally you give them honey, uh, spare frames of honey that you have from other hives. If you do not have that, then you're going to give them syrup. Um, but if you want to encourage your bees to build comb and for the queen to lay and to give them the impression that there is nectar coming in, then you want to give them syrup. Giving bees honey actually won't make them to build comb. Uh, it can actually do the opposite. And so um, it's just important to understand like what exactly you're, you're doing for your bees with these different actions. Uh, if you are getting a nuke, um, this isn't as much. So if you're, you're getting a nuke, there's going to be one to two frames of honey in there, which means your bees won't be starving. And the question is, if you want to encourage your bees to grow a little bit faster, you can make some syrup and put that in a feeder in your hive. Uh, don't put a ton in there. And if it's starting to get warm out, keep an eye on it to make sure it's not going bad or moldy or anything. If you are buying a package, then you really want syrup because your syrup is going to prevent your bees from starving. <laughs> uh, if you have honey already from frames from previous years, you can put that in the hive to, the hive to prevent starving, or you can give them syrup if that's not an option. You're also going to want some syrup in a um, spray bottle if you're picking up a package uh, for so that you can just spray the package down. Um, before you install your bees into the hive just makes it a little bit easier to keep the bees calm and prevent them from wanting to fly or sting you when putting them into the boxes Pippa Cat says, fondant is popular in Ireland, but I tried to leave about five kilograms of capped honey and frames to get the bees through winter spring yeah, that's ideal. You know, the so that sugar feed under the inner cover, it's not just a backup. I mean, there's no reason why you wouldn't have a backup. Um, but of course, you should be leaving the bees as much of their food as possible because that's what's best for their digestive system and their health. Um, but that feed under the inner cover can also help to absorb moisture uh, the condensation that forms under the lid where the cold air from outside is hitting the hot air that's rising inside your beehive that the bees are producing. And so uh, that food, the fondant or the white sugar you have under uh, up top in that hive will absorb the moisture so it'll prevent it from dripping down onto where the cluster might be below and it also will absorb it because the bees do need moisture in the winter time and so then that that water is not lost and it goes into the feed for the bees to access if needed ideally you don't have to the bee the bees won't have to access this food, but um, um, sometimes it happens and it's not necessarily bad when the bees have to be fed in the winter time. It's bad when the bees have to be fed in the late spring and the summertime. That's when you know that you really have to move your bees somewhere else because you shouldn't have to feed your bees throughout the entire year. Um, Retirium. Hello there. Well, it's two colonies this winter. Any advice? Um, my advice to you is to really try to figure out what, what potentially caused the colonies to collapse. Like, was it timing? Was it the, the weather that year? Is there something that you can do to try to prevent it for next year so that you go into this winter feeling a little bit more confident? Um, I have a video about what, what killed my bees that is a good place to start to help to figure out. Um, you can't always figure it out, but I think it would help you for the next season if you had a better idea of, of what caused the collapse. Um, 
This is Hularis and Pippa Cat. To make sure my bees have enough honey through winter, I'm thinking about keeping some frames of the honey in the fridge. How long can I keep it in there and how do you store it? Um, well, it depends on when you're putting the honey in the refrigerator. Yeah, once it's cold enough out, put all the honey you think the bees are going to need in the beehive. Don't plan to add honey to the hive once it's cold out because it's one thing to open up the lid and to throw some dry white sugar on your inner cover but it's another thing to open up the hive and crack open the inner cover and to be putting frames of honey into into the boxes that you know the cluster might be up inside um that can get a little bit trickier and it has to be warm enough out for that but if you are concerned that there's too much honey on your hive in like the late summer fall when robbing is happening you can take some of that extra honey off um, and store it in your refrigerator or your freezer the freezer is the best place because it will deter honey from crystallizing it will take a much longer time for your honey to crystallize if you put it in the refrigerator, your honey is actually going to crystallize even faster. <laughs> so um, a freezer is best, but no matter where you're putting it in, you literally just put the frame in. Uh, you can put it in a bag if you like. Um, when I shipped frames of honeycomb, I put them into, um, I bought those rolls. Um, like a vacuum sealer roll. Uh, and I have a sealer for my honeycomb, but if you also have a vacuum sealer, then you can seal it that way too. And I would just seal one end of the bag and cut it and fit. You can fit a, a super sized frame um, into those larger vacuum seal bags. And you can put that in your fridge, but if the honey is capped, putting it directly into your refrigerator or freezer is fine. You don't need to put it in any kind of container to prevent um, the honey from going bad. Unless, I don't know, maybe if a lot of it is uncapped, you might. But if it is capped, then nothing needs to be done. I have had boxes literally just off the beehive um, with the frames inside inside a chest freezer and put it in any kind of container. John says, honeybee healthy ingredients are sucrose, water, spearmint oil, lemongrass, and lecithin. Um, so there you have it. I don't, I, I mean, yeah, it, it sounds like you could totally make it yourself. I just don't know what the ratio is and uh, to syrup to those ingredients when adding it in yourself. And the bottles are pretty cheap compared, I mean, you, like the small bottles are sufficient because you're not adding a lot to your feed. Gregory says, uh, thanks John for looking that up for me. Uh, Gregory says, will bees take syrup when the temperature is low? Um, depends on how low, I mean, if they're clustered up, then no, if they're, they're going to be going around to the frames when it warms up then yeah they will take syrup but if it's going to get cold out again it's not good for the bees to take syrup because from what i've read there's they're going to want to leave the hive to go on a cleansing flight when they eat syrup uh and um it's going to um Make them think that there's a nectar flow going on when you have um, syrup in the hive because it's similar to nectar. And when the bees are bringing nectar to the hive, it, it makes them think that there's flowers blooming. So it can be a little confusing. Um, Gary says, has anyone in colder climates used a new trend of microbial fondant patties with probiotics mixed in with the candy this last winter? I use pollen patties and sucrose sugar syrup when feed is needed. Good question, Gary. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, 
Pippicus says that we, when harvesting, we just left five kilograms of capped honey in each hive above the brood box, box so we didn't need to store the frames anywhere. <laughs> That's true. Some people just really like to harvest as much honey as possible. And um, some bees don't bring in enough honey for the winter time. Uh, but the best thing to do is to leave them a little bit more than what you even think you should leave uh, and see if there's anything left over for the next year. Okay, so let's see. Um, so when it comes to pollen, you can make your own pollen patties. Uh, once you have hives, you will find that um, the bees, I mean, you can harvest pollen. You can put pollen traps on the outside of your hives to harvest pollen. Be really careful with this because pollen can go bad. It needs to be kept I think you can refrigerate it for so long and then put in the freezer. Please let me know if anyone has more experience with harvesting pollen. If you can put it in a dehydrator and um, keep it to last long, lasting longer that way. What I found is that um, when the bees are getting ready to swarm, they will fill up the brood nest with pollen. And that is how they get the queen to stop laying so much. And some hives are very obvious about it. Not all of them are, but some hives you'll just see like a ton of bee bread in your hive, which is, you know, like the pollen mixed with nectar. And when I see that, I will take those frames out and I will freeze them. And that's, a, you know, a benefit to not using foundation or not using plastic foundation is that if you see that in like half a frame or something, I will cut even just that half of the comb out and put it in bags or Tupperware and stick that in the freezer. And then I will put that into a hive um, as needed. There's a lot of different options for pollen. There's like this powdered options. There's what Gary mentioned. Um, Um, John says that, uh, he just poured regular sugar in the rapid rounds. Um, and now he switched to fondant. You can just use regular dry white sugar. You don't need to make the candy. Um, and that's really just an option. Some people will add other supplements to their candy when they make it. They will add vinegar to it. Um, sorry, I'm reading all of the comments. Thanks for all the comments. It's nice to read what all of you guys are doing and to see everyone helping each other out because of course I don't, I don't know everything. I don't know a lot. <laughs> um, but I am trying to start the conversation and trying to help as much as I can. Let's see. So spring feed, one-to-one -one sugar, add a supplement to prevent nosema. There are a lot of studies about feeding bees and um, that are fairly interesting. I am still on the rebound from being sick and just had my first two nights of sleep that was uninterrupted and at least seven hours from my kids being sick. So I'm not really in that frame of mind or ability to read these things, but I highly recommend them to people who can. Um, there was a study that said, that found that bees when fed sugar had a shorter lifespan. Other studies found a lot of positive benefits. Some studies found very little benefit. Um, so when you would want to do more of a two to one, um, feed of syrup that's when you want to encourage growth and during a time of dearth when there's not a lot of flowers blooming one-to-one -one syrup would be a little bit more like in the springtime when you first get your bees and you want to um, simulate nectar and then you would want even more sugar to water 
when um, you want just the bees to have some winter stores and there's a little bit less to evaporate. So like 15 pounds of sugar to one gallon of water would be more of the recipe you would use when you're looking to get bees syrup for their winter storage. Um, and when I say two to one, what I'm saying is like one part sugar, two parts water. And that's like more so to stimulate the colony and to simulate a nectar flow. Um, but, you know, uh, one to one would also stimulate a nectar flow as simulate a nectar flow as well. So it's really up to you. I really encourage people to just try different things and see what happens. Just keep in mind that just because you changed something doesn't mean that that's the reason why your bees did well that year. There's a lot of other factors that come into play. Um, never say never because. Uh, what works one year might not work again in the next year. Uh, real quick, before I address some of the comments, um, if anyone has a feeder that they do like, please leave them in the comments. I have made feeders that were like a Ziploc bag with little holes poked in it. I've made the can feeder or, you know, like a jar and drilled holes into the lid. Um, I've used a feeder that looks like a frame, but is a container. Uh, it's like the shape of a frame, and you put it in the hive instead of a frame, and then you fill that up with uh, syrup. I have bad experience with all three of those. <laughs> um, there are much better feeders out there. At the very least, you do not want to feed outside your beehive. That is a big, big no-no. Uh, the bees want to be be a secret. They don't want anyone knowing where they are. They are trying to be a secret. They don't want wasps and other bees finding them. And so putting a feeder outside the hive is, is a big no-no. And they will remember it um, come the fall, even if the feeder was outside the hive in the springtime. And it can lead to your hives getting rubbed quite a bit, which not only kills can harm the hive when they're being rubbed because of the robbing and them stealing the sugar and their food and from, you know, the guard bees having to attack these bees. But it also will make your varroa mite levels go through the roof when you have a lot of robbing. Um, so I... I'm not a fan of the homemade feeders because if they drip too much, then you can have a puddle of syrup on the bottom board inside your hive and you'll find bees dead in that, um, that tiny little puddle, even small little, little <laughs> puddles. Uh, if you have like what I do on some of my hives, the uh, screen bottom with the oil pan below or just a screen bottom, um, the trash trucks go by, uh, then it's not so bad, but if it's colder out and your bees might be clustered up, having that feeder up above your cluster and it dripping on your cluster can potentially kill them also when it gets colder out. I, like when you're picking up your bees, I mean, it, just because it's warm enough out that day, doesn't mean that next week the temperatures aren't going to dip down again because it's springtime and that's what happens. And then your bees are clustered up again for a few more days. Uh, so thanks thanks to you guys that have put the names of the feeders that you have down there. Um, let's see. Pippa Cat says we don't use any treatments with our native Irish bees. They seem quite resistant for to grow on my so far go so good. Well, that's great. Um, uh, I'm curious what the native Irish bees are. Do you harvest honey from the native bees as well? The native Irish ones? Pippa cat living the dream over there. It rains a lot. <laughs> a, a lot of rain is not ideal for bees. The students I have that live in the volcano area here on this island, um, they don't have an easy time 
with with beekeeping sometimes it can be weeks before they can open the hive and see what's going on um but they also have small hive beetle and varroa mites and so the small hive beetles really go out of control in those wet areas Um, I use rapid round feeders, small amount of drowning, no lifeguard on TV. I'll have to check out the rapid round. I, um, I know that feeding bees can encourage, um, your splits and to grow faster, but I've never actually, I very rarely feed them. I will only feed my bees if I've seen that they are struggling and it's more of a way to problem solve what the issue is. Like, you know, is if your bees, if you have a yard and all of your bees are doing okay, and then you have like, you know, two or three hives that are struggling, you want to help them out and you want to figure out what's wrong. So feeding your bees and doing a mite test is usually like the first two things that I do to see if, um, the feed simulates, you know, like nectar, um, a nectar season for them and the mite test to see if it is an infestation or a lot of viruses that they might have. That's kind of like those first two things for me. Otherwise, I don't feed my bees because it's really just there is a low nectar season, but I just allow the hives to consolidate. Um, I don't I don't sell my honey as my main source of income anymore. So it's just beekeeping changes a lot depending on what <laughs> your goals are. And so that's one thing I'm trying to do with some of these videos is explain to people what, what to do as a hobbyist because that is very different than when you're trying to sell your honey and you want to harvest as much as possible. Um, or maybe you're a hobbyist and you still want to harvest as much honey as possible, <laughs> then maybe you're going to take some tips from those commercial operations. But uh, otherwise, there might be better ways to do things that could save you some money and some stress, but your bees aren't going to be bringing in as much honey as other hives. Um... Uh, another person says several cell feeders, they're on inside on top of the frames, easy to fill and prevent robbing. I've had a lot of drowning in my bird bath when my bees first came out a few weeks ago. They do need water ASAP at the end of winter. Interesting. Well, so if you usually bees get enough water from their nectar uh, and the water is only necessary when it's warm out and they need to cool the hive down. But uh, they do need water in the winter time and that's why you don't wanna absorb all of the condensation in the hive. You just wanna make sure the condensation isn't pulling up on the bottom uh, for the bees to drown in and it's not dripping on the cluster. Um, so I wonder if the bees just don't have enough nectar or if um, you're right, and then maybe they do need water as soon as possible at the end of winter. I, um, one of my best yards was next door, the property next door had donkeys and they had a water trough for the donkeys. And the woman was out there one day and she informed me that my bees used her water trough. Um, and I don't know if she was kind of mad at me about it or not. I, I'm very bad at telling when people are being passive aggressive, I suppose. Um, she informed the owner of the property that he should have a water source out so that her donkeys didn't have to deal with all the bees at their water trough. Um, so yeah, it is possible that your bees do need water right from the start. I never provided my bees with water when I was in Philly uh, or in Hawaii. They've always, I guess, just found it somewhere. But um, it can't hurt. The guy that sent me the nectar feeder also sent me a water feeder, a water fountain. Um, and I'll have to 
give you guys the name of it. He's on Etsy. And he makes these cool glass bowls that are solar powered. It just has this little solar powered fountain in a bowl. Uh, so the water is constantly flowing, which is good for me here where we have mosquitoes and we don't really want water sources just sitting stagnant. Which has always been my problem is that I, I cannot get out to my yards and constantly be giving it fresh water. Um, and there's just so many mosquitoes. I don't want stagnant water sitting around. Uh, Native Irish bees, they're dark in color. Some people call them black bees. Interesting. Gary says he's used pollen traps in the past, also bought freeze-dried pollen and mixed it with homemade patties, made a two-to-one sugar syrup with mint. Not sure if it made a difference and added water. So you added freeze-dried pollen with a two-to-one sugar syrup and mint, like mint essential oil or like mint, I guess, uh, or mint leaves in the patty. Um, freeze-dried pollen. Hmm. Uh, sorry, I'm just reading some of the comments. <laughs> okay, so if, um, Anyone has questions about feeding bees, like when to feed them or what to feed them, please write it in the comments. Um, I'm going to have to sign out in a few minutes because it is really hot in my office and my voice is starting to get really, I'm starting to lose it. We're all kind of recovering from really bad sore throat. Um, Sarah says, put rocks in your bird bath. Uh, yeah, you can. So if you're looking to give your bees water, you can put rocks in your bird bath. Another thing is you can take a towel onto any water source, like a pool, um, or if you have a pool that has like a cover over it right now and the bees are drowning uh, on that where the rainwater is pulling up, you can take a towel and put that where the water is, like over the ledge. And the bee, the towel essentially turns into the beach for the bees. It's super cute. They all just like land on the towel and will slurp up the water from the towel. And then they can walk as close to the water as they like. And um, yeah, hummingbird feeders actually are another way to feed bees water or sugar. Some of them have a guard for bees to prevent bees from accessing it. Uh, don't, you know, get the one with the guard on it. June book says, why would bees eat through their emergency queen cells? Well, I mean, I guess they're probably empty or they don't need that queen anymore. The queen must have, she probably already hatched and um, killed the other queens. And so they're going to open up those queen cells with the dead queen. Um, or those queens would have hatched already, or it's just not necessary. They don't need it um, for whatever reason. But usually they wouldn't kill an emergency queen cell with a viable queen inside if there wasn't already a queen um, in the hive. Uh... Prospecting with disability. I have a small, one question says, I have a small hive. What ratio should I use to help them grow? Um, you can use either a two to one or one to one sugar ratio to help them grow. But 
um, without being concerned that they have enough food. If this is springtime and you're concerned that they don't have enough food, you want them to grow and also not starve, then uh, one to one ratio of sugar plus water is good. And I would do that by volume. Uh, if you, if they have food in the hive and there's food to be gathered and you just want them to grow a little bit faster and build some comb, then you could do a two to one ratio. And that would be two parts water plus one part sugar. And that two to one ratio isn't as much to prevent the bees from starving, but to simulate nectar coming in. And that can encourage nectar. Uh, the bees to build comb and the queen to lay and give them the impression that nectar is coming into the hive. Um, either one is okay, but the two parts water to one part sugar is to kind of fool the bees a little bit into thinking that nectar, oh, nectar flow is going on and to get them to build a little bit faster. One to one ratio of sugar to water is more so to help your bees in the springtime when they need food and um, there's not a lot of blooming. And then you would put even more than that, more sugar in, in the late fall when you're trying to just give them that last little bit of thicker syrup that they can um, put in the hive and not have to evaporate, do as much work to evaporate moisture um, before. Um, eating it I suppose <laughs> oh gosh close to midnight in the UK <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone for logging in it's 1 57 in the afternoon um, I know it's not really an ideal time probably for almost anybody because it's dinner time people are just getting home from work or maybe it's midnight <laughs> Um, let's see, let's see what Gary has to say. He knows what to do. I've used all those kinds of feeding, started out with quart jars and glass, now use inside cap and ladder feeders. There are a lot of people using one gallon plastic buckets on top of their lid. That is a lot of syrup. <laughs> that must mean you don't plan on visiting that beehive for a while if you're putting a gallon plastic bucket on top of their lid. Uh, Sarah says, way off topic, does melting comb kill wax moth eggs, etc.? I mean, yeah, if you're melting honeycomb to the point that it's melted and not solid anymore, then it probably has killed the wax moth eggs in it. Um, I have a video to post. I put frames of drawn out comb that we're sitting around into a nuke box and put the lid on it, just two frames, put the lid on it and put it on the side of my house with old, with uh, unused beekeeping equipment. I opened it up three days later and there was already two or three wax moths in, in the box, just hanging out. I mean, I don't have bees on my property. Uh, and I did this because someone had emailed me about what to do about wax moth on frames. And she had mentioned that she knew she was supposed to have them exposed to sunlight, but didn't. And now there's wax moth. And I was curious, these frames have been sitting out for, I don't know, at least six months, maybe a year, not in the freezer or the refrigerator, just sitting out in the sun like um, exposed to sunlight, not in direct sunlight, uh, by my equipment, totally fine. And I put these two frames into a enclosed box and the wax moth found it within three days. Pretty interesting how fast these little bugs can, can find it. And they really do love it when it's in darkness. If it is out in the sunlight, they, I don't see any wax moths on it. Um, one person says, will cedar wood blocks you put in your closet for moth protection work in the hive for wax moth? I have no idea. Um, it might. 
you don't really, I mean, you wouldn't put it in the hive with your bees because your, your bees would be, you don't. Wax moth doesn't necessarily want the wax in a beehive with, with the bees on it. They just want the beeswax. They would probably prefer an empty box to a box with bees in it. But when storing your honeycomb, putting cedar blocks might help um, to deter wax moths from going inside it. I guess it depends, though, on how airtight the container is that your, your comb is in and whether the cedar is a uh, strong enough scent to deter them. Um, I have to do some research about wax moths. I don't know a ton about them because they're so not threatening. If there's like not that much you have to do to protect your hive from them. It's like once wax moth is bothering your hive, you have bigger problems because it's, it's like the, one of the easier things to get rid of. It's kind of like chalk brood. If you are looking up what to do about chalk brood because it's been in your hive for a while and you don't know how to get rid of it, your hive has bigger problems because if they can handle moldy brood and get rid of it before it starts to look like that, then then they're, they have some issues with their hive's hygiene and they might be really weak. Um, and they they actually might might be struggling in quite a few ways. Um, but when storing equipment, that's where you would want to put the cedar blocks because that's when the wax moth is going to devour your frames, and they're not going to be. You don't really have to worry about wax moth coming into a hive. You just have to worry about wax moth taking over your drawn out comb when it's not in the hive. Uh, what are the things that keep wax moth away from hives? Wax moth doesn't, I mean, they just, I think bees. <laughs> Bees, uh, so I have a short on my YouTube shorts videos of a wax moth larva going in and out of some cells. And um, a few people have disagreed with me about whether this larva is hiding from the bees. I think that it is hiding from the bees. Other people say that it's just falling in and out of the cell. Um, the bees don't seem like they care that this larva is here, but um, I think the larva is actually hiding from the bees. And I was really surprised. I have never seen a wax moth just scurrying around on honeycomb like that with brood in a large, healthy beehive. It, the few times I have seen wax moth in a hive, when the hive wasn't like really small and struggling, but like, you know, a regular, normal, healthy hive was in those brawny Dynamax towels that I use under the lid to kill, to trap the small hive beetles. Those, those towels, just like the pollen padding you might put on the top bars of your hive, it's just like this area that the bees usually are not guarding it. And um, I've seen a hive beetle larva under there and I've seen wax moth larva in there, under there in the little fibers of the towels. Other than that, they don't want to be in the beehive. They just want to take over beehives that bees have abandoned, actually, um, like the cockroaches. They will abandon beehives as well and spiders. So like um, this uh, up in the hitch says, should I store my supers in my barn or lean to the outside? Um, So if you're keeping your equipment away from like wax moths, you would want to store them and like rotate every other box so that sunlight is getting into each box. You don't want it dark in there and that's when the wax moth is gonna come in or that's when a mouse might want to make that its home. Um, cockroaches, 
I mean, the cockroaches will really eat anything in the sunlight. Um, if it is cold out, then you don't really have to worry. You can do whatever you want to if it's freezing temperatures or, I don't know, maybe below 50 degrees. Um, or if you have a room that's air conditioned, like the place I worked for just had a big room in their warehouse that they sealed up and turned a whole bunch of big air conditioners on in there and kept the room at like 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And that was like really enough to just keep the small hive beetles and any other pests like at bay. And they were just, it wouldn't kill them, but they wouldn't be active. Uh, and they also had a light like in this one area. And I think the light also attracted maybe the hive beetles um, to this area of the room. Um, so you either want to keep the area cold or you want to have sunlight on it. And that will deter the pests for the most part. If you're in here in Hawaii, good luck. This, uh, I, I, if I can't store it in the chest freezer, I've come to accept that something's going to eat it. If not a wax moth, then probably a cockroach or a mongoose. Um, I mean, the mongoose are in our compost pile and eating through the water tubes. <laughs> that cause uh, um, flooding in our kitchen and all that fun stuff. They're kind of like ninja cockroaches here in Hawaii. All right. I have to go. Thanks for logging in, everyone. And thank you for understanding. I had to cancel last week. It was just a little too much. All the coughing and poopy eyes and all that other gross stuff that was going on here in my household. Um, if you have anything else to add, please leave it in the comments. Uh, I love to hear from all of you guys. And as always, if there's anything you want to have a next live video about or me to film a video about, please let me know. Leave that in the comments too. I will announce the winners next month and send it out in the newsletter and um, leave a response below the comments that for the people that won the 20,000 subscriber contest. Um, and have a good weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>